<laughs> Dude, how are you? I appreciate you doing this. Yeah, thank you for are you inviting stoked? me. I am. I'm yeah. super stoked. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Got to talk to your wife, got to talk to the whole team. I know. What are you doing out here this week? Like what's visiting with the team. Okay. Yeah. How much of the teams out here? Probably a dozen or so. Okay. Yeah. Some people flew up from Southern California. Yeah. So Is uh, it is it weird being back here? Um, I haven't really got to see much of the city yet. Yeah. You know, I always get disoriented here. Yeah. Uh, I don't, I mean, it's not linear like New yeah. York yeah. Uh, or downtown Austin. It's, yeah. it's a little bit, you know, you guys have sideways and yeah. Yeah. Like the streets aren't numbers. Yeah. yeah. Right. So <laughs> in union square, it's at an eight minute walk, but I know that, you know, you, I mean, eight, 22 minute walk, but I know that, uh, in Is that, that's where you came from. Yeah. I know you, you end up encountering all kinds of different situations in san francisco so i took an uber so yeah smart what was funny was we were at rue last night uh-huh across it was good yeah yeah and then my and then uh our svp of partners was he drove me back to the hotel and we actually came down this street and i'm like i we were literally on the street on this corner and i said san francisco is so interesting like it looks so he's like there's it's so different in many in different places i'm rooting for san francisco though so are I, you i wanted to come back but like uh doesn't it behoove you for like uh for selfish reasons, let's just say if Austin or somewhere in Texas became the Mecca, yeah. like, wouldn't that be good for you? Like, why are you rooting for it? I wanted to come back. I think it, it was the center of so much innovation, you know, and I feel like it was, I mean, you, you built your career here. I think a lot of people that I know in the Valley or, or, yeah. or San Francisco built their career. Austin. Austin has its has its certain certainly has its vibe. It's changed. I mean, I grew up there. Yeah. Um, it's different though. I mean, I'll tell you. I'll tell you a quick story. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I was selling security systems at at a at a certain time in my life, and I remember I went to this guy's house. It was on the UT golf course, so the house was easily seven figures. And my pitch at the time was, you get a security system, you save on your home warranty. Your, your mortgage, you save, you know, whatever it is, a dollar a day. So it's 30 bucks a day. And the guy goes, I don't have a mortgage. And I said, what do you mean? And he said, I paid, I bought this thing cash. And it turns out the guy moved from California, from San Francisco. And that was in 2010. And so since then, I think about 185 people net have moved to Austin per day. And so people, you know, during the pandemic or after the pandemic have said, what do you feel about all these Californians moving? And I'm like, they've been moving here since 2010, 2009. Totally. Yeah. So. I, um, I live during COVID. I was living in Austin, uh, two Februaries in a row, mm -hmm. which was worst time. Like, and by the way, in the last three Februaries, it's been the same storm that keeps hitting, that keeps hitting Austin. I wonder like, like the, the question around, Hey, how do you feel about all these people from out of town coming in? A lot of tech people. Mm -hmm. One of the things that I loved about Austin that I've always said, are you in Austin? Yeah. In proper. Austin proper. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Proper. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, is that it's this very eclectic, progressive, liberal town mm -hmm. in a very conservative state. Yep. And so you kind of get the best of all worlds. Yep. You know, whereas I think we lost the script a little bit here because we're in a left and then a, in a bigger left kind yeah. of box. You know what I mean? Yeah. Um, yeah, yeah. And, um, and I think the, the, the way that that showed up for me in the kind of work setting was it was so nice going to dinners and really never overhearing conversations to my left and right about tech. Yeah. And, you know, even here it's, you forget how nice it is to have like it. You forget how nice it is when you're not here to just have that reprieve mm -hmm. from like all we do is live and breathe what we do. Right. I was out to dinner with the GitHub CEO at, at some restaurant in Palo Alto, Tamarin, and it. I was honestly uncomfortable having a conversation with him because the tables were not very far away from each other. Yep. And. I knew the people to my left and right were talking about tech and venture and all these things. And I'm like, God, I can't get away for a second. Mm -hmm. I can't even have a normal conversation over a meal. 
Yeah. And on your trajectory with this podcast, everybody's going to know who you are. You're going to be a celebrity. He can't even go to lunch with you. <laughs> I should have kept it. I should have kept it. This, thank God our YouTube uh, views are low. I should have kept it just audio that I could just be the, the, the anonymous oh, voice. I mean, as soon as people hear your voice, though, it's like in a restaurant. You're like, is that Jubin? <laughs> um, I um, when you were selling the uh, the security system, it was a physical box, right? It was. No, it was it was uh, I had the demo box. You know, I would, I'd carried like this, this luggage type thing around with me and I'd prop it open and I'd show people the keypad and did this whole demo, you know, it was product, product demo with discovery before it was a thing, you know, it's like product like growth. Is that what you call yeah, that's it? right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But that was an interesting job. Actually wasn't my first sales job. Um, but that was a, that was an interesting role. Like in, when you don't know any better, you don't know any better, right? It's just, I want to sell, I want to make money. I, um, Correct me if I'm wrong, but you probably were not like the rest of the people selling security in that no. job. No. And I say that because you're not like the rest of the sales leaders that I talk to. You're not like the rest of most of the people in our industry. How so? And, um, well, one, you're very soft-spoken. And I mean that nicely. I don't actually, I don't know if I need to caveat that, but you're very soft-spoken. Two... I find you um, very different from me in the sense that I probably fit more of a similar mold of I speak and then I think rather mm -hmm. than, than thinking and then speaking. And, um, and it struck me how thoughtful you were. The first time we spoke was a reference for Liam, yep. who's on my team. And... The first five minutes was me asking you questions. Then the next 10 minutes was you asking me more questions about the role. Then the next 10 minutes was us just saying how lucky I am to have Liam on the team. Right. But I remember the interaction being very Socratic mm -hmm. from your perspective. And I was doing the reference. And I was thinking, <laughs> I was thinking, how the hell did that happen? <laughs> And uh, so that was our first interaction. Then I saw you in Vegas for reInvent. No, coffee. Where? We met for coffee at House Tooth. Oh, that's right. Yeah. That's right. That's right. That's right. And then in Austin. That's when I found out you were living in a suitcase. That's when you found out I was living in a suitcase. <laughs> was I living in Austin or was you I were, just traveling? You were you were living for a certain period of time. Okay, yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. yeah, yeah. That would freak you out, right? First time I first time I met you in person. That would freak you out, right? What? To like, li like living like you can't do that. Now you have three kids. Yeah, three kids, a wife, you know. <laughs> I do wish maybe, you know, fifteen years ago we did that, but I was like uh rolling around the country with my backpack and a carry on and my my uh, microphones in my backpack. Yep. Yeah. <laughs> Living the life. I mean, it was COVID. What was I going to do? Yeah. Um, then, so then Vegas. Then Vegas, yeah. And I remember you asking me, how did you say it? You said, why don't you look at me when we talk? And I was like, is he trying to fight me? Like, no, no, no. I, it was a different version of that. <laughs> okay, what'd you say? I said, you're the first person that I've ever met that it's, it's how people describe talking to me Yeah, because your eyes are everywhere uh -huh. while I'm talking to you. <laughs> and everybody has always, always given me that feedback, yeah. uh, especially my wife. Um, but I got to experience that firsthand with you and I felt it so relatable because the way that you described it was it's a movie that you can't turn off. Uh, you're always constantly taking in your surroundings, mm. what's going on around you. What are people wearing? You know, I can be in a restaurant with, you know, for in a work setting and I can know the people behind me, they're on a date. The people behind you, elderly couple, uh, the people to the right, they have a teenage son with them. You know, I, it, I, I take those signals in, you know, what people are wearing, jewelry, shoes, facial expressions. It, it's just a constant intake that you can't turn off. Is it subconscious? It is very you much so? so. Yeah. I mean, like we just mentioned when you met me for coffee in Austin. Yeah. I remember the whole time you were on your elbows, leaning forward, feet back, knees forward. You're wearing a gray sweatshirt. Yeah. 
And I just, I could feel your energy, right? The way that you were speaking. Like, I remember that vividly. You probably don't remember what you're wearing. I do. No way. That's like savant like. And, and maybe if you could turn that off, would you? I think, I think it is a. Because isn't it exhausting? It is. And you only have so much space for so many things to hold in your head. Yeah. I think I have to be, as I've grown, I've become more intentional with it. I've, I've figured out how to use it to my advantage. Um, my older son is a lot like me, um, uh, from a professional setting. So I'm, I'm using my learnings to help hopefully accelerate him understanding himself. Mm -hmm. But I, I don't think I would turn it off because I think it makes me who I am. It allows me to assess situations that I wouldn't normally assess. I can, I can, I figure out, I, I figure out people pretty quickly. I figure out situations pretty quickly. I figure out, I feel like I understand the answer. Um, and then it's about validating that answer through questions, through other people, through, um, you know, other data points. And the eye contact thing. Uh, I asked Liam about this when we were at dinner just the other day. Mm -hmm. And cause I could feel myself doing the eye contact thing with him yeah. where I, where I literally look at everything else. Like when I was a kid, my family used to make fun of me because when we'd be at dinner, my jaw would be just wide open and I'd just be staring at another table because <laughs> I'm just so fascinated with what's going on. And I didn't have the ability to even somewhat compose myself to pretend like I wasn't. Mm -hmm. And so my eyes dart around when I'm looking at, when I'm talking to someone, it's actually really, it, it's really rude. I mean, it it's is. not, I wish I wasn't that way. I can't help it. Mm -hmm. Um, and I said, oh, is this what Javier, like, does Javier do this? And he said, no, he'll more stare at one spot kind of right next to you. <laughs> <laughs> like staring at your coffee mug right now. Yeah. Yeah. But you're doing that to focus in on everything else that's kind of going on around you. I do it to, to clarify my thoughts, to think, um, when I'm looking at you, yeah. it's really difficult for me to, I feel the same way because when I'm staring at you, I'm taking in all of your facial expressions, the way that you're reacting. And when I, when I get onto that train of thought, I can't, I can't process my own thoughts. Right. So let me ask you this. When, um, are you more effective at communicating, whether that's listening or speaking when you're on the phone or when you're on a zoom? Ooh. On a zoom, I th something about zoom, about being on video, um, either when I'm talking to one person or when I'm talking to a group of 300 people on an all hands, I typically pick out one or two people and I just, I act like I'm talking to them on a video. That makes sense. And I can, and I can see them nodding and I'm looking for validation of the things that I'm saying. I don't know why it's easier in person. I mean, I'm sorry, easier on video, but yeah, I don't know. For me, I can't, I can't really focus even on zoom my best focus happens over the phone because there's no pressure mm. or expectation of any, I'm just listening. Yeah. And there's no pressure of the zoom's the worst for me in person. Second phone is the best. And it, because I don't, there's no social expectation okay. and I can think, mm -hmm. I can think when I'm not staring, you know what I mean? Yeah. yeah like yeah. that's why to your point, when I'm not looking at you like right now, I'm thinking mm -hmm. it's hard for me to process when I'm like locked in like that. Yeah. I don't know how to explain it. One of the most difficult things. And I think this is really where I realized that I did a, uh, I did a customer testimonial for a, for a vendor one time and they brought in their cameras and lights and they said, you have to maintain eye contact with the camera while you're speaking. And I didn't have a script. So I had to tell them my true thought. They were asking me questions as in an interview style. And I was staring at the camera and we probably did 40 takes. Like I could not keep <laughs> eye contact, <laughs> you know? And, uh, I had the total new appreciation for acting at that point. It wasn't acting. It was me, you know, talking, uh, to the camera, but I mean, it was tough to, to maintain eye contact. But let me ask you this. Don't you think that part of the problem is when I'm, if I could turn the movie off, I don't actually think I'd have a problem keeping eye contact. I think that the problem with keeping eye contact comes from the fact 
that I feel like I need to be having all of these other observations and thoughts and mm-hmm. things going on in my head yeah. because I can't help it. Like it's just happening mm-hmm. almost like it's like, it's a, it's a, it's an outer body experience. It if is. that makes sense. Yeah. Like, it's like I'm watching myself talk. I can't explain it any other way. Yeah. And it, and it, I don't know about you, but at times it can, you have to regulate your own emotions because when you feel yourself talking, like I am now in a room with yeah. the microphone in front of me, you could almost go into like a third party assessing your own talk track and body language. And then you start to get, you know, even more self-conscious and then you get off, off track, you know, yeah. it was like, um, you know, in, in sports, you, you're, you're playing a game, but you can like, you're almost acting out or, or talking in your head about what's happening. Yeah. And it's, uh, it can mess with you a little bit, you know? So you have to, you have to regulate that. You have to, I don't know. It's been a process. I find, um, I find, um, I find the movie in my head to be very tiresome. I, um, I never, I never realized that most people don't have that. Yeah. I never realized that it's like this hyperactivity mm-hmm. that just doesn't stop. And the like, I, the eyes thing is just more ways for me to like keep consuming information. Right. That's like feeding my like hyperactive brain. Yeah. It's almost like I have to be doing more than one thing than just talking to someone. You feel like it's your superpower? Um, it's like probably like one of those like worst thing, best thing type things, mm-hmm. you know, like I think it, um, I think it pushes me to just, I think I have a bias for action because of it, yeah. if that makes sense. Mm-hmm. And I think I have just a lot of ideas on things right? as a result of it. I do think that it, you know, I'm very impatient, which I don't, you don't strike me as impatient, but are you, are you? I'm very, you are. Okay. Yeah, very. Okay. So you just have a calm demeanor. Impatient and competitive. Very. Yeah. But yeah, go ahead. I, no, I go ahead. Yeah. I just, I think that, um, I think what you're saying is that you, you have so much going on that you just have an impatience and you have to, you have to go put it into action. Is that what you're saying? It is what I'm saying. Yeah. For me, it's a little different. I think it's, it's, it's processing the situation, processing whatever's happening and then trying to decipher what to do next, what to, how to action it, how to respond. And in a social dynamic, um, I can come off soft-spoken Mm. quietest in the room, but I'm, I am assessing, I'm listening. And over the last few years, as my responsibility has grown and more people I interact with, I have to be very intentional with my expressions, with how I express my, um, uh, my thoughts, you know, and, um, you know, I, 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 I call myself a social introvert. Mm-hmm. I don't know if that's a thing. Mm-hmm. Because I am very social. I'm not, I, when I read introvert uh, descriptions, that's not me. I don't, I don't like to be at home. It does, I don't recharge or being away from people. I actually get charged up being around people. Mm-hmm. So the social dynamic is, is different than a typical introvert. But the introvert tendencies are, you know, a lot going on in the head, not a lot of coming out of the mouth or facial expressions. When you're, can you just sit behind a computer and do focused work for hours? No. I can't for the life of me. And that's where I get tripped up, which is that not only is my brain restless, but my body is restless. Mm. Like my leg shakes. I can't help it no matter what. Like it's like, (laughs) it's just like oozing out of me. And the, I don't mind the like physical aspect of it. You know, like, like I feel like when I wake up, I work out because I have to get rid of some of the energy. Yeah. Otherwise I'm going to like implode, you know? On the, the mental thing, the problem that I run into is like last night, I'm laying in bed and I'm thinking about this conversation, I'm thinking about the next conversation, I'm thinking about what I have to do on February 16th and February 28th and the movie just plays out uncontrollably. Mm-hmm. Just Now, am I like firing off slacks to people with like thoughts on like we need to think about this and this and this that, that were legit, like we do need to think about those things and probably do a few things around them. Yes. So I do think there's something there that's like pushing us, you know, Mm -hmm. 
but also I was sitting there and my heart is beating out of my chest at like 1130 at night. Yeah. And I'm like, dude, like I'm like doing breathing exercises, you know, like all the things. I'm like, I gotta, we are too similar. I got to relax. <laughs> you know, are people listening to this going like these two are just <laughs> weird. <laughs> Well, listen, I, I hope that other people who are listening to this that maybe feel this way know yeah. that it turns out there's other people that also think this. Because at first I thought everybody feels this way. Mm-hmm. And then I realized, oh, my God, I think I'm the only person that feels this way. Yeah. And then as I talk about it a little bit more, I realize everybody has some version of this. Yeah. Some version of, you know, living in the future. It's very rarely living in the past for me, but it's almost always living in the future. Yeah, it creates... It, it creates the inability to be present. It creates um, kind of a form of anxiety and a, a need to be urgent with your actions. Mm. You know, I think with with you, it's at night. With me, it's actually I crash at night. Um, it's the morning. My mind after five and five in the morning, it 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 starts to, you know, the movie turns on and I'm in my subconscious. I'm thinking about meetings and work and. I'll text my EA at 5.30 in the morning and I'll say, hey, did we get that meeting scheduled? And it's some random email that I got last Thursday that I archived that I Do completely thing. forgot about. But my my subconscious remembers it, that it was an open task that I didn't complete. And where that comes from in my subconscious, I have no idea. Do you think it's your superpower? It's my superpower and it's also my Achilles heel, if I'm being honest. Yeah. Um, it It allows me to interview really well and assess talent. It allows me to read situations. It allows me to understand room dynamics and people of influence and responsibility. It understand, it helps me understand my customers. My Achilles heel is I'm known for being hard to read. I'm, you know, as we're talking right now, right? My, my facial expressions are probably pretty flat. Mm-hmm. Um, I'm known to be, um, pretty direct, pretty quickly. And that's because I feel like I understand the situation. I understand, Mm -hmm. um, the candidate, for example, um, it's my Achilles heel and I'm not as expressive. I think a lot of people like extroverts because how, how they're so expressive and flashy and they can, they're witty and, Mm -hmm. and they can say things pretty quickly and they're fun to be around or, you know, that's not me. So I think there's, there's certainly pros and cons to it. You know, I, and I, and I am learning as I'm growing how to, how to use it. You know, one of the questions that you also asked me in Vegas that I am not kidding you. I probably spun around for a week and a half. I texted you. (laughs) I texted you and I'm like, dude, what the fuck was that question? Like it has, (laughs) it has spun me upside down. It, the question, I wrote it down. It, I, well, I'm going to butcher it, but w- what's the question? Do you remember the question? What is a common misconception of you? Yeah. What is a common misconception of you? Did I ask you that question or did you only ask me that question? We were talking about, we were talking about interview questions and asking questions that are kind of against the grain. And I feel like that's my entire interview style is asking questions that get people to reveal things that are allowing me to assess them at a much faster pace. And I have a, I have a several dozen of them, but what is a common misconception is one that I always ask. And I asked that question because, and I told you about it because I, I forgot what the, what the topic was, but the reason I use it is because it allows me to, I don't, I don't, let me back up a, a second. When I get into an interview, I ask people, when I, before I start my line of questioning, I ask, I, I let them know, I'm going to ask you a line of questions. And when I do this, I'm not just listening to the words that you say, but how you say them, your body language, the priority of words that you use. Because when I first started interviewing people, I was doing that subconsciously, but right. I wasn't letting people know. And they were like, I interviewed with Javier and it was just rapid fire all over the place, context switching. And I don't know where it was going. So I found it to set the stage a little bit. Um, so this, the, the, what is the common misconception of you? I'm looking for self-awareness and I'm looking for, cause I think people that are self-aware know that 
they may be a little self-conscious about whatever their the misconception is, and they actively proactively try to address it. So, uh, you know, so they may say a common misconception about me is that the most common one I hear is that I'm very nice. I, I hear that all the time in interviews. People think that I'm very nice and that I'm a pushover or that, you know, but I'm actually not. I'm very, you know, when I believe in something, I, I will drive it to its end. Um, but, you know, if someone is like, oh, that's that's a tough question. Um, my common misconception is that people uh, say that I smile a lot. I'm like, OK, you know, there's not much substance behind that. There's not you haven't really thought about that. You're you either are not paying attention to what people are telling you or feedback that you get, you're getting because mm-hmm. any experienced professional has had leaders that have given them feedback or they've done 360s or they've heard feedback from from people around them. So that's really what I'm assessing is have is that top of mind? Are they thinking about those things? Because that is a leading indicator for me for coachability and the ability to be coached. What's one of the favorite answers that you've ever had to on, that on that question on that question? Do any stand out? Or any question. Yeah. Like, like, are there are there any interviews that you've done that blew your socks away? Yeah, there's there's several. Um, I mean, I think some of my favorite interviews that I do are ones in which we get to the point, and I think you I think you do this a little bit too with your podcast. You get people to the point to where they're revealing things and talking about things that they weren't expecting to talk about. Mm. And it's not like I'm looking for deep, dark family secrets. Mm -hmm. What I'm really looking for is how well do you know yourself? How well are you in tune with the areas of strength and the areas of opportunity and how to get better? Um, I'm, I'm looking for intelligence. How well are you able to, to assess certain situations or assess what's happened in the past? I'm, I'm looking for ambition. You know, what do they aspire to be? Um, do they have that inner drive? I used to call it the X factor when I first got into leadership. You know, you can always tell when you meet with somebody, you're like, okay, that person is, they want to become something. And so to reveal that I'm asking questions like, you know, what's the most difficult feedback that you've ever received in your career? Who's your favorite leader that you've ever had and why? What is a common misconception about you? What is something that you've always struggled with? You know, and I've just accumulated these questions through hearing other people interview through podcasts that I've listened to through my own, you know, creation. And in doing that, I start to get to, I start to get these answers that start to reveal what type of person they are um, and what they care about. And I have a, on the top of my interview doc, it, it has strengths, uh, areas of concern and unknown. And as I'm hearing someone talk and I'm watching their body language and I'm listening to the words You're that just they jotting use, down bullet points, I'm jotting down like thoughts, like random thoughts. So it keeps me, it, it keeps me from being biased towards the candidate. I'm just literally just com- like jotting down the things that I'm, that's coming top of mind. And then when I'm done, either the areas of concern are really long and the strengths are short or the strengths are really short or long and areas of concern are short. And I'm like, okay, I like this candidate. They're good. So to answer your question, I don't know if I've, I think the, 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 the candidates that I've really enjoyed speaking to are the ones that just really are in tune with, you know, what they're about, because that, that tells me that they have so much potential. They have so much more in them. And if they come into my org or I get the chance to work with them, we can start to pull them up. We can start to develop them into much more. Why, um, why do you think that those that have self-awareness have so much potential? So I like to, um, I like to draw two circles, one really small circle and fill it in with a marker and then a really big circle and fill the very bottom of it with, with marker. And one is a person that has learned a lot and experienced a lot, but there's no more room to grow. The circle's filled. The big circle has just as much experience and just as much that they've learned, but there's so much more in the circle for it to to be filled in, to to grow. So people with self-awareness, I think that they have a, you know, the the term growth mindset is, is what people use a lot, but 
they feel like there's always something to learn. They haven't mastered it all. There's, there's an ability to become much more. And I think those people are the ones that I, in, in my opinion, can evolve. They can change. They can help lead others through change. Um, they're easier to coach. I would just say. When, um, when did, when did you realize, how do I ask this question? When did you realize that self-awareness was a thing for you? Like, when did you start to find out that you can have this outer body thing with Javier evaluating Javier, not just in real time, which is crazy in itself, but just that you have this inner identity that can be molded and shaped. Like, at what point did you realize that there's a thing there that if I understand it better, it's my, call it shortcut to improvement? I mean, pretty recently, I would say. You know, recently in the last six, seven years. I, I, when I think about my childhood and think about interactions with people at school or sports or cousins. Mm. It was always there. I just never, I never knew how to control it. I never knew what it was. And, um, I think the professional setting has really kind of started to pull it out because now I'm in a more structured environment. I'm being asked to coach and mentor and lead other people. Um, I'm looking for certain traits and I think I've just, I've just spent time getting in tune with what makes the best people that I've ever worked for or with, what makes them great. And just picking up on those things. Have you always been a different type of cat? Like, have you always felt a little bit not the same as most of the people in your peer groups? You know, I, I think probably my younger years, um, I, I, I didn't feel that way. I feel like it was probably like college professional settings kind of out of my element, you know, diff- I was working with different types of people, people from all different kinds of backgrounds. Mm. That's kind of where I felt like I was, it, it, things started to change for me a little bit. And I don't know. And I, and I still think about this. I don't know if it was me maturing. I don't know if it was my wife pulling more out of me <laughs> yeah, or, or, or just the world evolving around. I don't know. I, I can't, I can't explain that. Yeah. I, I, I wonder if part of it is that if you always feel different, most of the time different is not perceived as great by yourself, mm-hmm. right? Like you want to fit in. Like I remember when I was a kid, I always felt different and I always wanted to fit in. And so I wanted to change. I didn't want to be the person that I was. Yeah. I wanted to be more like everybody else. Mm-hmm. And so I struggled with self-awareness because I didn't like the person that I was. You know what I mean? Like, yeah. like I, I resented that I was different. It started with my name and then it went down from there, you know? <laughs> yeah. And so I think when you don't embrace that different is good, mm-hmm. I think it's really hard to be self-aware because you're not really embracing the person that you are. You you're really you kind of want to be something else. Yeah. Does that yeah, make yeah. sense? It does. It does. And it, it's, it's, a, it's an interesting situation, right? Because, you know, in my role you know, my team is 300 plus and I interact with some people daily, others maybe twice a year, um, in person, maybe once a year. And so the perceptions that get created or the, the, the idea of who I am, I think a lot of it sometimes is is misunderstanding. And so I have to be very intentional and thoughtful with how I communicate, how I, how I, am transparent with the things that I want to get across to the team, uh, whether it's in, in written or through Zooms or on stage presence, those sort of things. And in doing so, hopefully they get a window into how I'm thinking about things, because to your point, it's only come to my attention over the last few years that I am a sales leader, but I don't view myself as much of a traditional sales leader, mm. you know, thinking about things holistically, you know, um, my current CEO says I'm the I'm the most long term thinking sales leader he's ever met. Mm-hmm. I was kind of offended by that mm-hmm. when he said that because you know we ne- we have to get deals done now. But I think it's I think it's in my nature to think about things how everything works together like an engine, you yeah. know. And I always kind of come back to that term of making the engine productive and making the engine effective. And it's not 
sure I can go chase down half a million dollar deals all day long, but what else do we miss that are big levers that change the trajectory of our business? Mm -hmm. When you were growing up, what was conversation like at the dinner table? Yeah. You know, we didn't really have conversations at the dinner table. Um, we were always on the go. Who's we? A younger sister, mom, dad, you know, I, there was always sports. There was always practices. There was, there was things of that nature. So we didn't really, it was in like a traditional dinner setting, I would say with our, with our family. Mm -hmm. Was it, um, can you explain that? Like, what do you mean you didn't have conversation? Yeah, we, I mean, I think we, you know, how's your day going? How are things? How's school? Okay, very topical. Very topical. It wasn't, it wasn't as, it wasn't, you know, really pulling into, you know, feelings or, and things of that nature. Do you feel like you do that with your kids? My natural setting is there. Um, I think I've learned probably over the, over the last years to, to really kind of be intentional with my questions and to, to, to just have conversation. And I think when I think back on my childhood, I was very supported. I was happy. I, I felt like I did what I wanted. I also feel like, you know, I was, I was in gifted and talented programs. I was passing with straight A's, but I never studied. Um, and sports, you know, I was making teams, but I wasn't like putting in the off season workouts. So I felt like, you know, my parents did their best to provide the childhood that they, that they could. And I felt very supported. Um, but there was topics that I, that I didn't really talk about, mm -hmm. um, that I've, you know, to no fault of their own. I just, I just learned as, as we went. So, you know, I feel like now as a father, my duty is to help kind of give them insight into, you know, what's coming down the line and at least having conversations. Yeah. You know, I still remember very small things that my parents said, you know, growing up that like, I still think about, you know, I still, I still remember. Um, so I, I think kids are listening mm -hmm. and it's just about how do you take, take advantage of those opportunities. Um, can you tell me when you, um, when you bought your first home, <laughs> I think there's a story there. I don't actually know it, but I'm just curious. When I bought my first home, I was, I was, yeah. When you bought, I was, uh, I was told that I should ask you the stretching that you had to do when you and your wife, I think it was your first home. Maybe it was your second home. I don't no, know. Both actually. Yeah. <laughs> it depends on who you talk to because yeah. I have two stories for two different houses. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. So just to set the Deal, stage. Dealer's choice. Yeah. Just to set the stage. When I graduated college, um, first off, I didn't know I wanted to be in sales. I was, I was all in on marketing. I didn't know sales was a career. Um, I had actually, I went to school to be a, a pharmacist cause my, my mom is a pharmacist. Um, I took one semester of biology and chemistry honors, biology and chemistry. And I called crying home three months later. Like it was terrible. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I'm switching to business. So marketing is the, the degree I'm going to get into. I did a marketing internship, um, at a company in Austin looked like fun. And then I started finding out, you know, there's the account directors that are making big six figure money and then there's everybody else. And, uh, I took a, I took a, a class in college with a uh, professor that was a Johnson and Johnson horse shampoo salesman. And it was professional salesmanship. It was, uh, interviewing. And so I was, you know, 22 years old doing cold calls and objection handling and how to do interviews. Mm -hmm. And I just fell in love with sales. I just fell in love with like the, the art, the competitiveness of it. Um, did a, did an industrial sales job there, um, uh, for a little bit. And then I moved back to Austin. Um, we can talk about that one too. That was a, that was an interesting whole, whole new appreciation I would say for, for non-software sales, mm -hmm. um, got into, um, uh, selling security systems. Um, and that was, that was a journey in its own. You know, I got back to Austin, I was interviewing for construction companies. I was interviewing for electrical companies. I was, I interviewed with Dell just to take orders to, you know, for, for home computers, mm -hmm. didn't get that job. 
I was, I was depressed. You know, I was, I was literally depressed. Were you married? Um, I was not married or engaged. We were dating okay. yeah, at the time. And I remember I was in this, you know, anybody that's been in Austin knows who, what Kirby Lane is. Kirby Lane's like a breakfast place. And I was in Kirby Lane, really emotional with my parents. Just like, I'm, you know, it was the first time in my life that I hadn't been successful. Like, you know, I'd gotten I'd good grades. I had been, been in sports. I played baseball through four years. And I just couldn't get a job and it was tough. And I got, a, a, uh, her name was Adriana. I still remember her. She called me for a uh, job at a home security company and I got the job, got engaged. Um, uh, my fiance then, wife now, she moved down to Austin with me. We lived with my parents for a month and we found a house. And uh, she wanted to get an apartment. We had two dogs. And like, there's, I was like, there's no way we're getting an apartment. Cause I was already thinking about home equity and, you know, building up equity in the house. And I, you know, Austin, it was 2008. It was the middle of the reset, like the recession was starting and, yeah. and I didn't know it. I was 23 years old and we got the, we, we got the house. Um, they accepted our offer, but they said, you need a down payment. And I think it was like 32 days. We had no money. And the down payment was like 6,500 bucks, 6,500, 6,500 bucks. Uh -huh. It was 3% it was of the, the whole, the total house. And so we, we, uh, we just started saving everything that we could to put that down payment down. We got the house, no furniture. And so there we are, you know, like she was a social worker making, you know, equivalent to teacher salary money. I was selling security systems, um, going to being at home and uh, I was in home design studios meeting with people. And we had a mortgage of, I think, 1350, 1400 bucks, somewhere around there. You know, my, and my paychecks were 900 to 1800 bucks. So we were, we were grinding there for, for a while, you what, know, what did that feel like? It felt like there was no other option, you know, to be honest with you, like we didn't feel pressure to make our mortgage. We felt like we were just, we knew that we could build we could get ourselves to a place to, to be successful, you know, and, you know, a lot of sacrifices along the way. Um, that's a much different story than our second house. Go ahead. What's the, sec what's the second house? <laughs> the second house we, so we had, we had, we had my son, Jacob, we were, we were deciding to move to a new home because we needed more space. We wanted to have more kids. We wanted a better school district. And this is probably the story that you heard. And, we, you know, we find the house, we, we do everything. We, we sign the, we get the paperwork. You know, when you, when you, when you buy a house, they give you a whole pack of paperwork and it has all the fees and down payments and all that. And then it has the mortgage and I saw the mortgage and there was a three in front of it. <laughs> and for anybody that's in New York or California, they're probably like, what are you talking about? But in, in Austin, that's, that's, that was a lot at the time. And I almost fell out of my chair. <laughs> I was like, honey, we are. We're no longer eating dinner out. We're eating pizzas at home. We are not, we're not traveling the whole thing. Like it's, it, we're shutting it all down. I, we can't afford this, but we're going to do it. But I jumped into it feeling like not only would we figure out how to afford it now, but I felt like it was on me to be successful and continue on a trajectory that's going to put us in the position to afford it long term. Mm. Um, you know, that was 2015, you know, um, six months before we got taken private, um, two years before I went to Mongo. So six months before who got taken private solar winds. Yep. Which is where you're working at the time. Yep. Yep. Sorry. And yeah, so I think things ended up working out. Thankfully, fortunately, uh, I think it was a bet on ourselves at the time. Yeah. When I was growing up, my dad, uh, was in sales. He was a, um, he sold timeshares and um, he would always tell me that the best thing I could do for myself was put myself in debt, <laughs> go yeah. buy a car that I can't afford. Meanwhile, he's putting himself in debt, like going to the casinos, you know, <laughs> so different ways of putting <laughs> yourself in debt, I guess. Yeah. But uh, I've, I've always, there's, um, there's something to be said for when your back's against the wall. And um, I think one of the things that, if I'm being honest, I get insecure about is I never, 
I never want to lose that feeling mm-hmm. of desperation. Yep. Especially as I rise through my career. But I also am desperate to get rid of that feeling of desperation. You know, like yep. I don't want to feel like I have nothing when I have things, mm-hmm. you know, but I also love that chip on my shoulder because it pushes me. Yeah. You know, mm-hmm. and I always struggle with that balance. Yeah, it's it's a hard thing. I mean, there's a saying that says the dying man wants one more day. The young man wants a thousand different things um, or you know, something similar to that yeah. saying. And it's, it, it is, it is a, is a constant reminder to, to try to stay present and grateful for what you have. Yeah. Um, when you think about a lot of the successful tech entrepreneurs or, or people that, that are, that are famous, a lot of them didn't come from great upbringing. It was that, it was that drive to be successful. It was the, you know, back against the wall. Yeah. Now I, I don't, I don't view ourselves in that sort of situation. I feel like we were fortunate to have a college education and Mm -hmm. to be supported and to do those sort of things. But, you know, I I was the number one rep in the country at, at, at Brinks and I made $62,000, you know, with a mortgage and just trying to make it, you know? Mm -hmm. So, yeah. Um, when, um, when you joined Mongo, and maybe I'll give the background for the audience. You um, went to SolarWinds and spent seven years there, mm-hmm. about. Then you went to MongoDB and you spent a little over four years there. Mm-hmm. About a, a year? Was it even a year into your shift at Mongo they went public? It was two months. Two months. Mm-hmm. And it was a huge, it was, a, it, was, it was big, wasn't it? Like the public offering was legit. It was, yeah, it was, it was legit. I think they had about 115 million ARR at the time when they went public. Mm-hmm. Um, then, most recently, you joined as the chief revenue officer at Starburst. This was in how long ago was that? About 14 months. 14 ago. months ago. Mm-hmm. Um, one of the thoughts that I had was that in your run at SolarWinds and your run at Mongo, you kept kind of climbing the ladder. Mm-hmm. And the the line of thinking that I had that I wanted to ask you is, you were kind of a homegrown talent at those places where you learned the system, you rose the ranks through the system, you were a product of the system. Now, you don't rise through the ranks. You come in and you're an executive at a pretty high flying company, mm-hmm. $3 billion valuation. It's got all the fancy investors. It's in the right space, all these things. Does it feel different to you? Yeah, it's a good question. It, it I mean, obviously in title and responsibility, it's different. Yeah. Um, but I you think- had a big job at Mongo, SVP of worldwide sales before you left. Yeah. 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 So uh, but my team is double now and, yeah. and, you know, reporting to the CEO, it's different than yeah. reporting to the CRO. But I think that, you know, I was a product of the systems, but I also feel like in, in my experiences, I've always kind of felt like I needed to change the way that things were doing, bring new ideas, break the traditional mold. Um, and so sometimes, sometimes that's a tough situation to be in because you're doing things People think you're doing things for your own personal good or your reputation when you're actually trying to do things in a more efficient, more productive manner for the company. Mm. Um, and so I, I, I feel like the learnings from those situations was that you, you take in your surroundings, you try to understand how things are being done, and then you try to figure out new ways to do things. And that's, that's what I feel like I've done over the past decade plus. Mm-hmm. So at Starburst, it's a very similar thing. It's, you know, there was obviously sellers before me, there were sales leaders before me, there was deals being done. There's deals that we need to now do moving forward. It's, it's very similar. It's how do we get more productive, more efficient, more effective. And although, you know, I have revenue in my title, you know, revenue means everything from top of funnel working with marketing to, you know, product feedback to, Mm -hmm. you know, how the sales engine works to, customer value, you know, customer success, we call it CVS, but 
how all that works together is what I feel like I spend a lot of my mind share on. Mm-hmm. Is it um when you joined the company was it bootstrapped? Wasn't the company yeah. bootstrapped for it a was, while? It was, yeah. I was um I was with uh the CRO of Procore, mm-hmm. I think last week, maybe two weeks ago. And they were essentially bootstrapped. I mean, they didn't really get a real round of funding until 10 years in. And um there was a I hate to use the word, but a grittiness that comes from that feeling. Yeah. Like the home, like that, the feeling of your back is against the wall, Mm -hmm. like that desperation where like you have to be very judicious about everything. I'm wondering, did it, do you feel that difference when you join like the, the, the DNA, the culture of the team when it comes from a place, not of excess, but of frugality? Does the company feel different? Yeah. Let me, yeah. Does if that I can, make sense? Yeah, it does. hundred percent. I can give you a, actually a quick story. So for anybody that's not familiar with SolarWinds, SolarWinds was a untraditional model in very traditional times. They, they built a company that was essentially all inbound product marketing and sales. The product just works. You, you find buyers in pain and you use digital assets uh, to move them down funnel before sales ever gets engaged, you use a great product to engage uh, customers, and then you use sales to finalize the deal and to expand the deal. Um, a perpetual license, but you could say it was almost product led before product led was a thing. Mm. And so, really, what that meant was that you know it was an engine that had to work all together. And so, I I feel like my 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 software career, my software career grew up in that. But the company was, you know, extremely efficient, you know. So think about I had I had sellers that were booking a million dollars a quarter, um, a quarter, you know, from, you know, Austin, Texas, making, you know, 50, 50 comp plans, you know, at that time was extremely productive and efficient. Um, And as as we grew as a company and as we became more successful, we we had to figure out new ways to extrapolate productivity. I mean, we had it down to the point to where we knew how much each lead from each product cost us and how much it took to get that opportunity to close one. So if we wanted five sales for application performance monitoring, we knew it cost Mm $83,000, right, for example. And so I I think growing up in that mindset, in that environment, um, and then when when we went private by Toma Bravo and Silver Lake, I'll never forget Tom and Bravo pulled us into a room and they, and they were talking about why they bought us, why they, why they bought the company. And they said, solar winds is the most, has the best EBITDA of any company that we've ever acquired. You know, think about that of all the companies that are in our portfolio mm-hmm. at the time. So extremely, extremely efficient. So I go from that to Mongo, which was high growth, you know, massive, massive market opportunity you know, how do we, how do we pour fuel on the fire sort of situation? And so I feel like I I got both sides of how to build companies, you know, like, um, a company that was extremely efficient, a team that was a team, a company that was, you know, uh, very, you know, cash flow positive Mm -hmm. to, to Mongo, which was we're using all of our investments to capture market. Mm -hmm. Right. Um, and I think there's two schools of thoughts, two schools of thoughts there. And so when I come to Starburst, you know, the company has its own culture. It's, you know, we're going to be, um, we're going to use meritocracy. We're going to, you know, up withhold character. We're going to, you know, we're a bootstrap company. We're a workhorse culture, not a unicorn culture. And so, yeah, I mean, I think you adapt to the culture and you evolve within the culture. And then you start to think about how do you, how do you get productive? And again, just using those past two experiences, how do you get the engine flowing? How do you get the engine going, mm-hmm. which is product marketing, sales, mm-hmm. engine, putting out features, mm-hmm. uh, using partners to, to drive growth, those sort of things. Before I forget, can you give the 30 seconds on like, what the hell does Starburst do? If you want to say the pitch that marketing gave you, feel free. <laughs> if you want to say how a customer uses it, feel free. Definitely. So Starburst is a MPP query engine. And what that means is it allows people to query data uh, performantly on a data lake 
or federate data across multiple data sources. So people use us rather than moving data into a single data source, uh, like a cloud data warehouse um, or, or a, a large data lake, people use us to query the data at the source, or if they have a data lake, they can turn their data lake into a lake house. Mm -hmm. So what that means, I guess, for the, for the audience is you can, you can decrease your time to insight because you no longer have to move data or ETL data. Um, you can, uh, reduce your risk within your business because you can use our technology to, you know, query logs. Uh, if you're a security company, you can, um, catch anti-money laundering use cases. Um, and you can also think about potentially commoditizing storage. So you can put your data where it's the most convenient and then use our query engine to access that data. Mm -hmm. When you were interviewing with your CEO, Justin, um, he had a funny reflection, which is not too dissimilar from when we talked. He realized that he was being interviewed. <laughs> <laughs> All of a sudden, the tables got turned. I'm curious, what were the things that you were asking him, mm -hmm. as specific as you can be? What were the, besides the obvious growth rates, revenue, mm -hmm. company values, what were the key things that you were really set on figuring out? Yeah, I think, I think for a startup and, and you know, this being in, in, in venture capital, so much of the success of some of these companies is based on the founder and the founder's ability to lead, to hire, to execute, to, um, their drive. I mean, early days, there's not a lot of things to celebrate. And so do they have that ability to get up out of bed, drive the business, be asked by sales for 10 different things and still have the, uh, have the, the, uh, the, the ambition and the, and the professionalism to navigate that as they build a company. I saw that at solar winds with Kevin Thompson. I saw that at, at certainly saw that at Mongo with David Acharya, one of the best CEOs in, in tech. And so with Justin, I was assessing, you know, does he have that energy? Does he have the ambition? Does he aspire to turn this thing into something? Or when it gets difficult, is he going to, you know, close the doors and try to sell it for parts? And so I was, I was really asking him, you know, for me, I was initially trying to un understand, is this a need to have or a nice to have? Mm. You know, I wanted to be in data infrastructure. That was where I built my career. That's where I felt like there was a tremendous opportunity for us for, for, for tech sales. Mm -hmm. He had that certainly, but you know, there's a lot of, there's a lot of technologies out there that are, you know, especially right now in 2023 where, you know, companies are, are worrying about, um, expenses and those sort of things need to have technology continues to be acquired, continues to be purchased because companies are trying to become, you know, they're trying to go through digital transformations. They're trying mm -hmm. to move to the cloud, so on and so forth. And so as recession proof as possible, I was looking for a need to have technology. I was also looking for what is the upside on this company? And not from a money perspective, but from market opportunity, are they doing things in an untraditional way? Right. If you think about solar winds, it was like the anti anti-traditional model. It was, you know, products that just work and you just kind of bolt on different technologies to monitor your entire data center. Mongo was a no SQL database company that was disrupting a traditional relational database world. Um, I was looking for what Starburst story was. And they're flipping, you know, data warehousing and single source of truth inside out. Mm -hmm. and I love that story. So I was from a, from a company perspective and from a founder perspective, mm -hmm. I was looking for those sort of things. I was, I was trying to gauge venture capital interest. I was trying to gauge revenue growth. I was trying to also understand how do they go about making decisions in the company, right? Is it a, is it a, is it the best decision wins? Or is it Justin's decision that wins? How do you figure that out? I forgot what the question was that I asked him, but he, 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 the way he answered it was, I don't try to find my decision. I try to find the right decision. And I, I've, I've told him that since, since that time, since I've been in the company, that, mm -hmm. that was the answer that won me over early on because what I was, what I'd seen in my past is sometimes the, the louder person or the person that uses data to, to arm themselves f for their own personal good, or the person that is, um, the most outspoken about something is, is sometimes the person that, that 
quote unquote wins, right? We're all in the same company, but they're the mm-hmm. person that the decision starts to flow towards mm-hmm. where, where he was trying to just understand the truth. You know, he was really trying to understand, you know, what is the right thing to do outside of, you know, when you distill it all down, mm-hmm. what are we trying to solve for? Is, um, is the rides that you had, the way that your resume reads is these incredible rides, right? Solar Winds, MongoDB, one of the defining technology companies of our generation. Solar Winds, like, couldn't be hotter. Or, um, um, Jesus, uh, uh, Starburst, wow, Solar Winds, um, couldn't be hotter, blah, blah, blah. Like, all, all these things, they read great. They read fine in your resume. A lot of people are going to be listening, thinking, like, how do I do that? I wonder, um, is your, when you're doing those rides, yep. does it feel how people expect it to feel? Like, are you, the way that I just described it, does it feel that way when you're in it? No. <laughs> There's a lot of revisionist history, I think, when it comes down to reading back your resume. You know, like company after company, you know, especially at, I mean, at Mongo, you had people that went, you know, PTC, BM, Blade Logic, BMC, AppD, Mongo. It's just like, wow, like one after another, uh-huh. you know? And, um, I think when you, when you start to really kind of dissect that, like the decision-making, um, it's a lot of, it's a lot of following great talent. It's a lot of following good people, intuition. Um, but I think, you know, the, that example I just gave you about that certain trajectory, that wasn't me. I mean, like we were talking about earlier, Austin's known for being a tech hub, but it's not like a Silicon Valley or a New York or a Boston type of tech hub. It's, it's different. I mean, mm-hmm. people, people build kind of an extension of their company in the, in mm-hmm. the city. Um, and so I can't, I can't honestly sit here and tell you that I was extremely intentional with every career decision. I feel like I was uh, walked into a company that gave me the opportunity to succeed, to make money, to become a leader. Mm -hmm. They continued to give me career opportunities, Mm -hmm. equity. Um, I, I actually didn't want to see it end at solar winds, believe it or not. Um, things happen for a reason. And then I joined Mongo by chance. You know, I, I ran into the VP of worldwide sales at a workout. Um, and, uh, you know, continued, took on the role and just tried to sell software and career can end up, can continue to grow. But I don't feel like I've ever been extremely intentional. And I know that sounds kind of mm. maybe weird to people because mm. uh, I think people are, I actually talk to SDRs that are, I want to be an SDR and then I want to be an AE and then I want to be a leader and then I want to be a VP and I want to be a CRO. I'm like, mm. wow, you have it all figured out. Yeah, I did not have that. Yeah. I, I was just, you know, personally trying to, trying to support my family. I was trying to succeed. I was, you know, I'm, I'm super competitive. So I was trying to win, um, for the company, for myself, for my team. Um, and yeah, I mean, I, I can't say it was, it was all on purpose. On the, um, the competitive winning thing. I'm curious, like, um, I can't imagine that you are, I can't imagine that winning, like winning is an expectation, but I also have a feeling that it doesn't feel that good to you. Is that fair? Yeah. It's, it's a short term feeling. How short? Maybe a night. (laughs) (laughs) Like you hit your year. Yeah. Like you, you get a paycheck, you get a promotion. Not really. It's not to me. It's not promotions or pay. It's it's like the success of a team. It's success of a person. It's success of the company. Um, yeah, I do like to hit our numbers, of course, but um, it's it's. I think it's just a general feeling of people succeeding, you know, and you know, as as the, again, my career and responsibilities get bigger, then that means that I'm responsible for that. So then my success is ultimately dictated in how I get people to be successful on their, on on their own. And when that happens, I'm extremely happy for them. I'm extremely happy for the company, but I don't think I, I don't think I do a good job of celebrating it myself. You know, doesn't that suck? 
<laughs> like it, it feels to me that everybody that I talk to experiences it the same way, which is that it's ephemeral. It comes and goes yeah. and you move on. And it also feels to me that part of it is that you, it has to feel that way. I don't know. I, there's very few people that I've met in the chair across from me that are able to celebrate and appreciate every little win and still have the drive to keep pushing. Mm -hmm. Like, do those things have to be mutually independent? What celebrating small things and then a big thing? Um, maybe I'll put it another way. I heard a quote recently that said, if you can't enjoy the climb, you won't enjoy the peak. Mm -hmm. And that sounds so good to me. But how I relate to that is there's no way I'm getting to the peak if I'm enjoying the climb. Like, like that, that's how I, that's how I think about it, which is that it's almost yeah. like this complacency. If I'm celebrating all these little things, that's what I meant by it. Does that yeah. Make sense? I, yeah. No, no, no. I, I completely get it. I, I enjoy the climb much more than the peak, you know, and, and I enjoy the, the grind. I enjoy the journey, I enjoy figuring out challenges and, and figuring things out. I, th I think when, I don't know if there ever is a peak, to be honest with you, like, you know, you look at my career and, and you even kind of see what, what these, you know, what, what Mongo's still doing, you know, they're still, they're still rising. And I, and I, I think they're far from the peak. I think they, they still have a huge opportunity. I think Starburst is just beginning. I think we have mm -hmm. a tremendous upside and tremendous potential in our, in our company, um, in a different way. And there's so much, there's so much opportunity, but we're, we're climbing right now. We're, we're grinding. And that's the fun part to me. And I think when, when I think about the, when I've made career moves in the past, it has been because I felt like I wasn't like in that grind, the challenge of figuring things out anymore. You know, I felt like it was more scale. It was, it was managing things. And, and, you know, I think, I think for me, I, I, again, going back to earlier, what I said, it, I haven't been extremely intentional with my career moves, but I think now that I'm reflecting, I think because I enjoy the grind so much, it's the earlier stage companies that I feel like, you know, solar ones was a public company, but it was still small. Mm -hmm. Um, it's, it's figuring out challenges and problems along the way. Does, um, as you're problem solving with people, does your, um, poker face, um, get in the way of folks feeling like you're really in it with them? Yeah. hundred percent. Like, is that a problem for you? I think, yeah, that combined with not communicating, uh, validation or displeasure. I think it's a, it's a, like they don't even think you're actually feeling the grind. Um, I don't know if it's that. I think it's like a, I don't know if he's doing it for himself. It's like a lack of trust. I would say, mm -hmm. you know, when it's actually the opposite, like I am so invested mm. to like helping you and the team and the company win that I'm just, I'm so locked in that I'm thinking about things. And I, I kind of joke with my direct reports that, you know, time, time has proven that you, once you work with me for, for at least two years, you start to understand that I have my best intentions at all times and I'm extremely genuine. And I guess that's my common misconception mm -hmm. is that people can't read me or, or, or feel like they potentially can't trust me mm. when I, all I'm doing is just trying to figure out the problems and I'm processing and I'm, and so I think I need to be intentional with how I communicate these things, how I talk through these things and certainly an, an area that I continue to work on. Um, this is a random question, but do you have Wi-Fi in your car? Uh, I do in, in our SUV we do. Yeah. Why? Well, initially, if, if I'm being honest, we, we got it because so people could, um, so my mother-in-law, my wife could browse the internet when uh -huh. we went down to the, when we went down to the coast. Um, it's conveniently now an, <laughs> an opportunity for me to work in the car. Yeah. Uh-huh. And, um, I've heard about this drive that you do from your home to your, to your wife's house, to your wife's parents' house to El Paso. Yeah. Mm-hmm. That's a far drive. And there's, there's myths that I hear about you 
<laughs> just hammering the Wi-Fi, taking calls. And you're like, oh, no, no, this is going to be a quick one. And yeah, yeah, six no. Six hours later, you're still on the phone. I know, I know, I know after, uh, you know, after Fredericksburg to I-10, there's a, there's a huge drop off in Wi-Fi there. There's no service. I know once we get to Fort Stockton, it gets a little bit stronger. Um, yeah. I almost spit out my wife. <laughs> Is it weird that I plan my calls on my road trips? No, not at all. I, I mean, I would go crazy. <laughs> I, would go, <laughs> I, 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 I have um, my team schedules. They know when I'm driving and that's when I have calls. Yeah. 30 minutes, hour drive. If I'm going from San Francisco to Menlo, I'm on a call. Yeah. It passes the time. It's the most efficient way to use the time. Yeah, it's, it, it is. And I, I, I think that. Now I don't have three kids and a wife in the car. <laughs> <laughs> They're doing their own thing. Yeah. They're, they're doing their own thing. But I, I think that, um, it, it used to be a not so great thing because when I was coming home, I'd make work phone calls and I'd get home and then I'd try to shut off and it would just, it, there's no un decompressing time before you get home. Yeah. And it, yeah, it was like, it, it never ended. Right. It was like, all right, I'm on my way home, make a work phone call. I get home, then I'm checking email again. And, and it just like, it just kept going throughout the night. And, um, I think what I, what we realized was that I needed some sort of break, like a, just a mental break of, you know, try not to make a phone call on the way home. And I try to use, I think in the early days it was use my drive home as my music or, or quiet time to, to like re decompress from the day. I think nowadays, because the kids are little, I, I make work phone calls on the way home. And then when I get home, it's like phone goes into the bedroom, mm -hmm. stay away from it, decompress with the kids. And then I check the phone later. One thing that has surprised me is I thought going into this, not just this conversation, but all the conversations that I have on the show, that all of these successful people would have broken marriages, broken relationships, divorces, et cetera, et cetera. That has turned out to be the exception. Most of the time, my observation, and I'm actually going to maybe write this down and figure out like how many, like most of the time I get the opportunity to talk to significant others. Mm -hmm. And I, most of the time I think, God, what a great relationship. Like what a great, what a, like that's awesome. Like what a great marriage. What a great support system. Mm -hmm. I wonder, um, that surprised me. I actually don't have a question. But it, it just surprised me. And I felt the same way about you. And um, I didn't expect that. Why not? I, um, I guess probably because I thought that, you know, the sacrifice comes at a cost, mm -hmm. a personal cost. Yeah, it definitely does. I think the first I'll say is, I couldn't be as successful as I am without my wife. You know, she, she put me into a position mentally, um, pushed me to a place where, you know, she, she pulled the best out of me, I would say along the way. Mm. And I think you, you may have run across that, uh, with a lot of people that you've interviewed is that they have great partners in life that are helping to be their counselor, their therapist, their, their backbone on in certain situations because, there are ups and downs in your career and in your life and you need someone to, to work through that with. Um, so I think that's probably a big part of it. Um, I think, I think for me, you know, making these decisions all along the way, you know, has needed somebody to help me out. You know, I always joke with my HRBP that I have my own HRBP at home, mm -hmm. you know, to work through, to work through things. You talk about work at home. Not as often as I should. You think you should talk about work more at home? Yeah. You yeah. do? Yeah, because I don't, I don't, I hold things in more than I should. And I don't, uh, and my, my wife knows when my mind's elsewhere, you know? And I think there's probably, yeah. yeah. Fucking eyes are racing. <laughs> yeah, that's right. <laughs> there's probably times where I should be like, all right, this is bothering me. This person did this, or, you know, I'm trying to figure out this situation right now. So I give a little bit of insight and transparency into what I'm thinking. And yeah. I think that's kind of the theme with just dealing with me, I guess. Isn't it funny though? Like, uh, if you're anything like me, which you are, 
it's not hard to like it's all over our face when mm-hmm. the movie's playing. Yeah. Like you know like you know the movie's playing. Yeah. Like when someone's talking to me that knows me, or in your case, if you don't even know me that well, when we're sitting down, it's so obvious they can just see it on you. Yeah. And sometimes releasing the pressure valve helps you become more present again. Yeah. Stops, it slows the movie down. Totally. Yeah. Yeah. Because I think I think you're just we're just processing so much that unconsciously we're not talking or thinking about or or expressing the things that we're thinking, right? And so then our body goes into this, you know, normal state. And people are like, Jubin, why are you why are you looking that way? You mm-hmm. know, why are you looking like that? But you know, I th- again, I th- I think that um, I'm I'm still I'm still trying to figure out ways to improve. You know, I, I don't think that I, I've certainly haven't mastered anything and i still feel like there's opportunities for me to grow as a person, as a leader, as a husband, father. Can I, um, I want to revisit and then I have to wrap this up, but I want to revisit, um, the interview thing, um, that, yeah. that, that you do and fascinated by it. You strike me as a world-class interviewer. I actually think you're very intentional about interviewing. I think most people are not. Um, my old boss, used to, um, Jeff, if you're listening, you'll get a laugh out of it, but he used to, when he would do an interview, he would sit back, Mm -hmm. he would sit back in his chair and almost just completely relax. And what he was looking for was to see if the candidate mirrored what he was doing. Yeah. He didn't want that by the way, just to be clear, he Mm -hmm. wanted them engaged. He wanted them on the tip of their toes, but he just wanted to see, uh, I, I can't really put my finger on why he would do it, but anyway, I, I think. Yeah, my college professor used to say that watch out for interviewers that cuss because they're waiting for you to to curse, uh, use curse words. And that shows them that you are willing to go below the line. Huh. You do anything like that? Like challenge them? Yeah. Put them into a situation? Yeah, I actually do. Um, <laughs> um, usually about so it's not always in the first interview first interview if if it's my candidate my direct candidate you know first is me answering questions them asking me questions getting that person bought in on me and the company and me hopefully setting the hook on what we're about um second interview is really kind of where we start to really dig in and a uh, uh typically about 60 to 70 percent of the way in i ask is there anything that you would have answered differently and it typically puts people on their heels a little bit. Again, that's kind of like the untraditional breaking the rhythm of the interview sort of thing that I do. And the reason I ask that is because I think, I think very hyper aware, self-conscious people, uh, not self-conscious, self-aware people, um, they, they go, like, Oh man, I answered, I asked that. Right, they're already stewing on an answer. Yeah, they're already, you know, and I think that the way that that portrays, and I think that's my, you know, one of my recruitment philosophies or, or is little things in interviews are actually bigger things in production when they're, when they're hired. Because I heard this told to me once, you know, the interview, an interview is the best version of someone that you'll ever get, mm-hmm. right? They're trying to impress you. They're bringing their best foot forward. They're answering things on point. Six months later, the shininess wears off. Things are tough. It's like a relationship. Yeah. They're dealing with the challenge. How are they going to handle that? Right. And so, you know, I'm trying to figure out like, are they going to tell a story that it's everything around them and not themselves? Or are they thinking about how can I change the trajectory of, of the situation that I'm in? And so I I think I just generally try to ask questions that frame that, you know, they, there's a saying, a problem well stated is half solved. And so I kind of view the same thing with interview questions. Like if you can answer a really great question at the right time, you can get somebody to go, huh? And then in the moment, it's a raw reaction. It's a raw, you know, here's what I think, or this is what I'm about, or this is what I did in the past. It's not scripted. It's raw because I think that's the version of someone that you're going to get in the role. You want to deconstruct the performative aspects of of an interview. Yeah. Yeah. Take off the, take off the performance pieces. Like let's, Let's see who you are. And I think because that's who you're, that's who you're hiring, right? Can you explain that quote that you just gave the, a good answer? So what was it? A problem well stated is half solved. What does that mean? It means that sometimes if you ask the right question 
and you frame it appropriately, you get somebody kind of half the way there, right? So I think the way that it portrays, sometimes we're in executive meetings and we're say, you know, we're, we're debating about certain things and then just kind of a pause. And then maybe the question is, are we trying to solve this or are we trying to solve this? And in the moment, like that's half the answer is that we're talking about a bunch of different things. Yeah, just framing it. Just framing it. Yeah. Framing it in the right way to get to get the answer that you want. Yeah. Do you teach people how to interview? I do. I do. It's I think what I've learned, especially when I've gotten as I've gotten into leadership, that some of what I do is intuitive or a lot of what I do is intuitive. And so, like, how do I turn that into a science for people? Um, that's, that's primarily what I focus on. And what I try to focus on the most is nothing. There's no one data point typically that overrides them all, right? If you have a first interview, you have back channels, you have, you know, second interview, you have, we do a PXT assessment, which is a, you know, intelligence and, and personality test. You have peer you peer interviews. And so like you end up accumulating seven or eight different data points. And I kind of view it as like a spider chart. You know, which one is, you know, maybe the back channel was a five, but the, you know, they met with your CEO and it's an eight, the, the PXT says it's a seven. And so you just try to point, put all those together. And so I think more teaching that, you know, um, along with many other methodologies is, is something that I try to focus on. Last one. Um, one of the company values for Starburst is grit, right? Did I make that up? Uh, it's, it's, it, it, it's within character, but okay. yeah, we have character, competence and ownership. Okay. So I made it up. Well, nonetheless, within character, how do you screen for it? Yeah. Um, within character or for grit in particular? Uh, I'm, I'm more interested in grit considering I made it up. I'm more interested. <laughs> I'm more interested in grit. Yeah. When I, what I'm really looking for is what is the most difficult feedback? You know, th- here's another interview question that I, I mentioned earlier, but what is the most difficult feedback that you ever received and how did it change you? And what I'm looking for is something that hit someone right between the eyes. They, they were told something that either they didn't know existed or that they knew existed and they didn't want to believe and they got through it. Right. There's a, that's one data point. Another one is talking through, you know, how they make career decisions. Walk me through how you've typically made career decisions. Is there a theme into why you've, you've transitioned to different companies? I typically have people walk me through from the day after they graduated college to where they're at today, no matter how experienced they are. And I get to hear how they've made different career decisions, whether they're following some, a leader or things got difficult and they left, or they had a great career run because of X, Y, Z. I don't think there's one particular data point to test for grit, but I think it's those multiple data points that end up telling me, okay, this person is ambitious. They've dealt with some hard times. They, they've brought ideas to the table that maybe they weren't heard Mm -hmm. themselves. Um, and they've continued to to push and drive on. They've, they've shown, they've shown the ability to, to be resilient. Um, you would be a great podcast host. I gotta be honest. (laughs) You would be a great podcast host. Um, I appreciate you doing this. Um, thank you. Believe it or not, it's an hour and a half. Um, which is crazy to think about. Let's keep going. I, um, I, uh, I could go for hours. I mean, this is basically what we talk about, except we have a microphone in front of our face. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, I always conclude the same way. The first, and God, maybe I should change this question up given what's going on, but are you hiring? Like, we, we are. Okay. Yeah, we're, okay. we're, <laughs> yeah, you know, kind of tiptoes when I ask no, that I question. No, I know. I get it. No, we, we, at, at this point, and, for people that may be listening to this in 2024, um, there's a lot of, you know, macro headwinds that are affecting technology companies these days. Um, we're certainly affected by that, but we are still hiring. Um, we are hiring across the, the any key roles, key roles. I would say, um, solutions, architects, technical account managers. We are hiring a couple more AEs, um, hiring for, um, yeah, I, across the board, I would say. All right, fair enough. Last one, what does grit mean to you? Grit to me means having the the mental fortitude to push through. My my daughter, you know, she's in pre-K and they taught her the the word resilience, which why they why they're teaching them that, I, I'm not quite sure. 
Um, but she, she says it all the time. You know, I'm talking to her, your uh, daughter, my daughter, she's four years old. She's smart as a whip. Um, and so at a high level, I think uh, grit is about mental fortitude, but there's also, there's also resilience that's built into that. And, um, you know, resilience and, and tough times and being able to push through, I think is, is a key component of grit. Javier Molina. Thank you. Thanks a lot. Appreciate it.